I'm going back to my parents' house for just one week. When I said this firmly, which was unusual for me, my husband laughed in disbelief, almost mocking me. Oh, is that so? Write your divorce papers, too, before you leave. Don't come back, he said roughly, as always. He must believe I'd never leave him, that I wouldn't write the divorce papers, and that I'd return soon. I was getting sick of him looking down on me. Understood, I'll write them. I quietly nodded and responded. As I started packing my belongings into the suitcase I took out of the closet, my husband clicked his tongue in irritation. What are you going to do without any money, stupid? He said loudly enough for me to hear. I ignored him and tightly grasped the envelope in my pocket. I'm Leela, 55 years old. My husband, Mark, is four years older than me. We've been living together as a couple. Since I was raised in an orphanage, I had no relatives to rely on. Sometimes I felt envious of my friends who had parents when I was a child. However, the fun times I spent with the staff and my friends at the orphanage became an irreplaceable part of my life. I miss that orphanage life, and this marriage was the cause. We don't have children, and people in the neighborhood sometimes tell us it must be nice to have so much leisure time as a couple. Each time I have mixed feelings because our married life isn't something to be envied. Most people would never notice that my husband treated me terribly since we acted like ordinary, sensible people outside of our house. Mark and I met at an equipment manufacturer where we worked after high school. I was a high school graduate and Mark was a university graduate, but we joined the company at the same time. I was assigned to a factory to manufacture parts, while my husband worked at the head office as a salesman. When I joined the company, I met Mark once during new employee training, but we weren't close. He was four years older than me. His sharp eyes and neat nose were exactly my type. However, I was too busy adjusting to the new environment to start a conversation with an older man. One day, while I was indulging in the fantasy of talking to him, Mark, who had been assigned to the sales department, came to visit the factory. Salespeople needed to understand the manufacturing process, so he was probably there to learn. Dressed in work clothes and focused on my task, I was surprised when Mark approached me and asked, Aren't you Lila? Even though we hadn't talked since the training and my hairstyle was hidden by my work clothes, he recognized me. I couldn't believe it. Yes, you're Mark, right? Exactly. We're from the same batch. Nice to meet you again, he said, speaking to me in a friendly manner. I was so happy I felt like jumping up, but I managed to keep my composure. After that, whenever Mark visited the factory, he would come to me and start a conversation. We talked about work and sometimes had private conversations in low voices. Since we couldn't talk freely during work, Mark invited me to dinner. I felt joy overflowing from my entire body. After several meals together, we naturally developed a relationship. In our fifth year at the company, we decided to get married. Now that we're married, why don't you quit your job and become a full-time housewife? I want you to support me by staying at home, Mark suggested. Filled with happiness, I agreed. At 23, many people were retiring due to marriage, and I didn't have much attachment to my job. I didn't realize that this choice would derail my future life. After getting married, my life revolved around housework. For the first year, I enjoyed a carefree newlywed life. I served dinner to Mark when he came home tired, prepared drinks when he wanted alcohol, and even massaged his feet when he asked. One thing I discovered after getting married was Mark's obsession with cleanliness. The house had to be spotless. I didn't mind thinking if it's for the person I love. One day, a friend from my orphanage days visited me. He worked shift hours at a call center, so we met during the daytime on a weekday. 
When she asked how married life was, I told her, I'm managing well as a full-time housewife. After hearing about my life with Mark, my friend said seriously, it seems like your husband is very domineering, Leela. It feels like you're just a housekeeper. I was shocked by her words. Being a housewife all the time, I hadn't realized how strange my situation was. Huh, isn't that normal? I replied, trying to sound unbothered, but I was shaken. Even after my friend left, I couldn't concentrate on my chores. When Mark came home before I had finished cleaning, he stumped into the living room with a scary look on his face, making a tremendous noise. Hey, are you here, Leela? Surprised, I jolted. The entrance mat is dirty. You're slacking off. He scolded me fiercely for this one mistake. I was very confused since I had never seen him yell so much before. The man standing before me was the exact opposite of the gentle husband I once knew. Next time, be careful. You're just a housewife with only a high school diploma who can't do anything. Those were the words my husband spat out as he walked away. I couldn't get the phrase a high school graduate housewife who can't do anything out of my head. From the first time he scolded me, my husband, a university graduate, looked down on me, a high school graduate. Perhaps he approached and married me to boost his self-esteem. Being with me, an orphanage-raised high school graduate, his competence could stand out and he could feel superior. After being berated, I couldn't think otherwise. My prediction came true. Since that day, my husband's attitude toward me changed drastically. Here's your allowance for this month, he said. Ah, thank you, I replied. In our household, we used an allowance system. Mark was supposed to give me money on payday every month. Being a full-time housewife, I humbly accepted the envelope from him. When I opened it, there was only $10 inside. Until last month, he used to give me $200, so when it suddenly decreased, I thought it might have been a mistake. Um, about the amount, isn't there a mistake? Since I was in the position of receiving an allowance, I felt hesitant to say it was too little, so I asked timidly. Huh, there's no mistake. Why should I give a lot of money to someone who can't even do housework properly? There was my husband laughing snidely. I was lost for words and couldn't respond. Do I have to survive on just $10 for a month? Of course, I hadn't been living extravagantly so far, but now I couldn't even afford to go to the hair salon. But I knew that voicing such concerns would be pointless. I gritted my teeth and held back. From then on, my allowance was just $10 each month. There were even times when it was as little as $5. The amount fluctuated depending on my work performance as a housewife in the previous month, but it never exceeded $10. Knowing I had no way to earn money, he intentionally didn't give me a satisfactory allowance. By doing so, not only could I not escape, but he could also satisfy his pride by supporting a wife who couldn't earn money. From the beginning, he married me to maintain his dignity. There was no love between us at all. When I realized that, I was so frustrated that tears welled up. He said, I love you many times, but was it a lie? When I thought that I had been deceived by my husband, I felt pathetic and wished I could go back to before we got married. However, such a wish is impossible to fulfill. I have to endure financial control from my husband for the decades of life ahead. I tried looking for a way to earn my own money, but if I worked part-time, my husband would find out. He strongly refused to let me work. If he found out I was working, in addition to financial control, I'd probably end up getting hit and bruised. I was scared and couldn't take a single step forward. Several decades have passed since I started suffering from my husband. I have managed to live while enduring the abuse and violence from him. It felt like I was living someone else's life, even though it was my own. The morning came and I waited for night to come. It felt like I was in prison every day. 
At 55, I was fed up with my daily life of just doing housework and turned on the vacuum cleaner with a sigh. At that moment, a call from an unknown number was displayed on my cell phone. Who could it be? In the early days of my marriage, I used to receive calls from former colleagues and friends from the orphanage, but in recent years, there have been none at all. The occasional calls I do get are basically only from telemarketers. Hello. I answered the phone, thinking it was probably another sales call, but it was a call from an unexpected person. Hello, is this Lila? It's me. The voice calling my name with a raspy voice was surprisingly my father-in-law. Father-in-law? It's been a long time. What brings you to call all of a sudden? Actually, I've been thinking about returning to Japan. My in-laws have been living in America for a long time. They worked there from the time they were salaried workers and, after retirement, decided to live there permanently because they liked the lifestyle. However, due to the impact of a pandemic, we have been unable to meet at all recently. But it seems that things have calmed down and they are thinking of returning to Japan. Wow, really? Of course, I would love to see you, I said. I had a good relationship with my in-laws. If you need anything, feel free to ask. They reached out to me like I was their own child. Having no family of my own, the warm call from my father-in-law made me almost cry. Noticing my emotions, he asked, are you having trouble with something? You should talk about it. A little hesitant, I told him everything about the constraints and verbal abuse my husband had put on me up to now. What, that idiot son of mine? My father-in-law, who had been listening intently, was so angry he seemed about to explode. I felt relieved to finally confess my feelings and reality to someone. I'm sorry I couldn't help you sooner, Leela. From now on, rely on me. I've had enough of living in America. My wife and I are returning to Japan, so you can count on us any time. Thank you so much. When I thought about my in-laws coming back to Japan, I strangely felt encouraged. I might be able to live without obeying my husband. Hope descended upon me and my heart pounded. That day, after hearing my in-laws were returning, I was so distracted that dinner was delayed. As it happened, my husband came home earlier than usual. What are you doing? Dinner isn't ready yet, he snapped. He glared at me with a demonic expression, looking ready to swing his hand. Reflexively, I took a step back. However, my father-in-law's words echoed in my head. You can rely on me anytime. His words gave me strength. I can't bear this life anymore. I'm going home for just a week. My husband laughed dismissively. Huh, where is your home, an orphanage? Write your divorce papers before you leave then. Don't come back ever again. His words were rough as always. He probably thought I wouldn't write the divorce papers and would return soon. I was fed up with his condescending attitude. Understood, I quietly nodded. I picked up the pen and started to write on the divorce papers he thrust in front of me. Are you serious? He asked, trembling. He had threatened me with divorce papers several times before, expecting me to beg him not to divorce me. But this time was different. He was stunned as I signed the papers. I started packing my things and took out a suitcase from the closet. During that time, my husband clicked his tongue in irritation. What are you going to do without money? You're an idiot, he said loudly. I ignored him, tightly clutching the envelope in my pocket. I left the house with my luggage and headed straight for a hotel near the airport. My in-laws were returning to Japan the next day, so I decided to meet them there. At the hotel, I took out money from the envelope I had hidden in my pocket and paid for the room. Recently, I had been able to make some money from my hobby of sewing. The orphanage that took care of me as a child was happy to buy the pillow covers and bedspreads I made. They paid me in cash so my husband wouldn't find out. 
Though I didn't know anyone from my time at the orphanage, the current staff were sympathetic when I told them about my situation and offered to help. They gave me encouraging words. You can always rely on us. I was really happy to use this precious money when I needed it most. Once I got to the hotel room, I fell asleep feeling relieved. I knew I could greet my in-laws with a smile the next day. They arrived the following afternoon. When I met them at the airport, they squinted their eyes and said, you've truly had it tough, haven't you? They empathized with the hardships I had gone through. It must have been really tough. I'm really sorry that I couldn't help you. We need to teach that stupid son a lesson, my father-in-law said, clearly thinking about what to do regarding his unfaithful son. After putting my luggage in my in-law's house, I immediately headed to the city office. When I submitted the divorce papers I had filled up the day before, I felt as if a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. Now I was a stranger to my husband. I savored the joy and happiness of being free. I planned to stay at my in-law's house for a while. As expected, there were a tremendous number of calls from my ex-husband on my cell phone. At first, it was a few times a day, but the next day it was 20 times, and eventually, it became a hundred times. He called me regardless of the hour. I was amazed that he was the one who had thrown the divorce papers at me. I could ignore or block his calls, but I couldn't stand the constant ringing, so I canceled my cell phone. I reported to my in-laws that I could finally have a peaceful daily life. That's not enough to calm us down. We need to figure out what to do, they said. We need to make sure he reflects on his actions. On Sunday afternoon, they told me, come with us. I got in the car driven by my father-in-law. I wondered where we were going, but the car drove along a familiar road and arrived at the condominium where my ex-husband lived, the place I had been living until a few days ago. Leela, do you have the key? My father-in-law asked without hesitation. Yes, I do, I said, handing over the house key to my father-in-law. Mark, are you there, Mark? He called out, stomping into the house like a debt collector. His husky, raspy voice was so powerful it made me tremble. Huh, who's there? Fresh out of the bath with his wet hair all messed up, Mark squinted at us. Dad, why? His eyes widened in surprise. No doubt he was shocked to see his parents, who were supposed to be overseas, standing in front of him. Long time no see, Mark. Ha! Huh. What are you doing here? Why are you in Japan? We came back because the pandemic in the U.S. has settled down. More importantly, Mark, we have something to talk about. Looking at me shrinking behind his father, my ex-husband seemed to sense what was coming and took a step back. Then he glared at me, as if to say, Why are you here? Why didn't you answer my calls, Leela? Do you have the right to ignore me? Don't mess with me. I shrank in fear at his fierce yelling and verbal abuse. My father-in-law stood in front of me to shield me. Mark, do you understand what you've been doing to Leela all this time? You took advantage of the fact that we were overseas and Leela had no one to rely on. Controlling her and using violence, don't you feel ashamed as a person? As a man, watching my father-in-law scold my ex-husband, I was stunned. He used to be quite a famous tough guy in his younger days, my mother-in-law whispered in my ear, and it made sense. That has nothing to do with you, Dad. Just because you're my father doesn't mean you can show up now and start lecturing me. Unable to back down, my ex-husband took a confrontational stance. But my father-in-law, unfazed by his son's bluster, pressed further. Nothing to do with me? No way. Leela is our daughter, and your mother feels the same. Do you enjoy tormenting and verbally abusing your precious wife? You're not our child anymore. We're cutting ties with you. This is disowment. Huh. Even I was surprised and looked at my father-in-law. 
He stood firm, staring at my ex-husband with a serious look in his eyes. This wasn't something said out of emotion. My mother-in-law, too, was silently nodding deeply. They had decided to disown their son even before visiting. You can't do that. And Leela, why aren't you saying anything? Why are you letting him accuse your husband like this? Husband, we're already divorced, you know. Huh? That can't be true. The divorce papers you handed me have already been submitted. What? My ex-husband turned pale, not having expected that the divorce papers had truly been filed. You don't ever need to show your face around here again. Get out of here right now. My father-in-law, who seemed even scarier than when my ex-husband yelled at me, shouted in anger. My ex-husband, his wet hair flying wildly, disappeared from our home. This house was actually owned by my father-in-law. At the beginning of our marriage, we didn't have much money, so we were taken care of in a property owned by him. For the past 20 years, we continued to live in the same house, under their care. Thus, my ex-husband was literally kicked out. You're an incredible person, father-in-law. It's been a while since I let my true nature out. In the past, doing things like this was an everyday occurrence. My father-in-law's hearty laughter made me and my mother-in-law laugh together. It felt like the first time I had genuinely laughed since separating from my ex-husband. Afterwards, my ex-husband, who lost his home, started living in a rundown old apartment. Unbeknownst to me, he was on the verge of being fired from his company due to misconduct. He managed to convince his boss to keep him as a full-time employee, but his position was stripped and he was demoted to a regular worker. His salary cut, he could only afford a cheap apartment with no bath or balcony. I felt relieved that I had gotten divorced before this happened. As for me, I am in the process of being adopted, thanks to the suggestion of my in-laws. I was surprised at first, but since I don't have any parents, I was very happy about this proposal and accepted immediately. My father-in-law and ex-husband ended up severing their parent-child relationship after all. My in-laws, who were actually quite wealthy, foresaw my ex-husband relying on them if they didn't cut ties, so they did it to avoid that. Under my in-laws, I mean my parents, I am living a life of ease and happiness. I continue to pursue my hobby of sewing, creating items needed at orphanages. The staff still purchase the items I make. Lately, I started creating bags and clothing to sell online. There are still few customers, but thankfully, there are many good reviews, and I expect the number of sales to increase in the future. Being able to be with my kind parents and enjoy my freedom to work, I am truly happy now.